All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Fridays with Fiscal. Today, we'll be discussing some intermediate topics in USAS R, and we'll be recording this so it'll be available to you and your coworkers later as well. I will be covering the posting periods and how they relate to accounts and reports, the activity ledger and the projects, and then we'll take a five minute break and Amanda will cover topics, including the account structure and reporting, the pending transactions, the modules and configuration. And I think what she likes to call her favorite, the monitor tab. If anybody has questions, please feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself to speak up. I am going to start with the wiki, where you registered under SSDT meetings and trainings. You can find the supporting documentation and the agenda right here. And then after today, you'll find the recording um, populated here. So again, here's the agenda and here's the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna start off talking about posting periods. And you can find these um, under the core menu. A posting period is a period in a fiscal year where transactions can be created or updated. You must create a purchase, uh, sorry, I was on the purchase orders grid. You must create a, a posting period first for the month to exist or for you to enter transactions. So again, to do that, you would go to the core to the posting periods, click on create. I'm gonna create September. And you can make it current or not. When you do create it, it is automatically opened and this little file folder with hovering tips indicates that if I click on this, it's gonna close the month of September such as that. And then the open folder, if you click on it, will open it right back up. So again, a posting period must be open to post transactions or to change a transaction, but a posting period does not necessarily have to be um, the current posting period. It, uh, current posting period can be open or closed. And this is kind of confusing. So how I got it was back in the old days, accounting was manual and done on paper with a pencil. And you always had to go get the physical book or the ledgers for the month, open the book before you wrote down any entries. So if you're changing anything with that pencil and editing the physical book or the posting or anything like a transaction within the posting period, you're gonna have to open that posting period before you make any entries adjustments or create transactions like a purchase order. It doesn't have to be the current period. You just have to open it by selecting that file folder. You do only have one current posting period and it's indicated with the green highlighted line. So we're in the month of August. It's also indicated up in the right-hand corner and everybody who logs in will see that. Um, again, you can delete a posting period with this icon as long as there's no transactions attached to the period. So if I try to delete September, 2021, it's gonna give a message that a transaction was tied to it, so I can't delete it. However, if I just accidentally create a January and I knew I caught it right away and I didn't post anything, I am able to delete it. So when 
That means in an open posting period, you can edit a purchase order um, and that option becomes available in the open period. You can change an invoice status from partial to full. An invoice date can be changed only in an open period. Under disbursements, voids can be created in an open period and you can reverse a receipt in an open period. And as long as the period is open, you can also create and enter future year requisitions. There are reasons to reopen a period, again, to make a transaction. So some real life examples would be the month is closed and the treasurer discovers that the bank interest was not recorded as a receipt um, in the previous month. So you would open the month and post the receipt and then close the month. And then the um, month, monthly reports in the file archive will populate with that new transaction. And that is why you have to open up a period and close a period so that those reports are updated and recorded as if it really happened at, on that date. You can also change an account on a receipt or another transaction. Or for example, the district has AP invoices entered, but the month was closed before the payments were processed. And the district realized that they had the wrong invoice numbers on the wrong amount. So they wanted to fix the errors before the checks are processed. They would have to open up the period and correct them and then reclose the period. And finally, another example would be a fiscal year closed, but the EMIS errors are discovered regarding transactions posted to the wrong account. So to fix these, you have to open the posting period. Reasons to make the, the posting period current would be if a user wanted a report ran as a particular date, like in the past. So for example, if the auditor, today is October, and the auditor wants a report of information as of June, 2021, you have no transactions to create or modify. So you don't have to open the period. You just have to make the posting period current so that your month to date numbers are, are being reflected on the report as of June. So it's like you're in June 30th, 2021. And that the report can be run without opening the period. You just make the period current, run the report, and you'll get your June totals. And by not opening the month of June, you also avoid um, any accidental postings from a secretary, say like in another building, because when a period is open, they are able to post a requisition while that period is open. So there's the safeguard. By just making the period current and running your report, um, no user can change um, transactions. <clears throat> so you see here, on this report, that this report was run in October, but the user made July as the current posting period and ran the report. So July's numbers are reflected in this month to date expended column. And if you look at the account while the, while the posting period is still marked July as current, then the account would also match so you're looking at it as of July. And here's another example. The budget summary was run in October at two o'clock for the period of September, 2020. The month to date figures would be what it was in September, 2020, as well as what's reflected on the account for the month. So you can change the posting period for current posting period for any report, but it is pretty much 
required when you're running any outstanding reports like the outstanding purchase order detail report or the outstanding disbursement report. Those you do have to um, change the posting period to a current posting period because of a report because of a report parameter. And let me show you that by going to the instance. When you pull up like the outstanding PO report, you see here that one of the properties that this report is coded or included is the current period remaining encumbrance. Therefore, whatever the current period is, it's gonna be on this report. And that's why on outstanding reports, you have to go back and simply change your posting period to a current posting period. Um, let me go back to that report. And the, again, the scenario was that the auditor wants an open PO detail report as of June 21. Besides that current post, current period remaining encumbrance, you also, when you run this report, wanna leave these parameters empty when you're running this um, report for the past, even though you're setting your current posting period to the past period, you're still running it retroactively. So the reason why you don't put any information in here because, because since you're already in the current posting period, you don't need any dates because you already selected the current posting period. And you don't want this to be set to true in voiceable because then it would, then the system would only be looking at the status, whether the um, purchase order is open or whether it's closed. It's not looking at the remaining encumbrance. It's just looking at the uh, open or closed. And that reason is classic looked at statuses for remaining encumbrance based on like the new, the partially filled, partially paid. And in redesign, it did not bring those statuses over. So it only knows open or closed. So pretend we're in made, uh, well, we made July current. So if I run this empty, I don't know if it's gonna be fast or not, but um, your report would reflect your outstanding purchase orders as of, in my example, July. Um, there are other reports that you don't have to make the posting period current. And these are like transaction-based reports, like the disbursement detail report. And the reason for that is you can choose the start and stop dates for the transactions because the information is being pulled by the start and dates that you entered, whether or not it's the current posting period. I shouldn't have ran this, I apologize. We'll give it a second. I'm gonna show you in a minute um, Wait a second, I think I can cancel it. So an example of the transaction based report would be um, the requisitional requisition detail report. Okay, here we go. So when you're looking at the query options for a transaction detail report. 
you have these start dates and end dates that you're asking the report to pull. So on transaction dates, you don't have to have, um, let's pull a report for August. You don't have to have the August as the current posting period. So you can even go back in time and pull 2020 without making that posting period um, current. I think I have an example here. Uh, I don't see where I have my, oh, here we go. So in um, October, I ran the period of those parameters. I just ran July through September, 2020, but I actually ran it when my period was currently August. But you see the data on the transaction report is actually what I asked for based on the start and end dates. So there's another option, and these are on the account-based reports. Um, account-based reports, you don't have to make the posting period current either. You can, but you don't have to. And the, the reason is, for example, the cash summary or the budget summary um, has a period option of total as of period. So my current period is July. If I wanted total as of June, I could enter a June date. And my, my report, the cash summary, would give me the June 2021 totals in the month to date columns and then the fiscal year to date totals for the whole entire fiscal year 2021 since June is the last posting period. It doesn't matter if you put in 6-1 oops, or 6-15, whatever you put in here, it's going to base it on um, that whole period. It's not going to limit to June 15th. It's going to pull through June 2021. Any questions so far on the posting periods and how they work with reports? All right, so here's the cash summary that we just ran as of June, marked up here, but we ran it in October just by simply adding that total as of report parameter. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is kind of like my favorite because I liked Oink in Reflections. Oink was the same kind of thing like in USAS web query. Um, you find this under transaction, activity ledger query. This grid is incredible. You can pull in so much information with the more button. You can get information on the PO, the invoice, the disbursement, receipts, refunds. Um, and there are other capabilities to filter further down with the advanced query, which I'll show you an example of that in a minute, because that's handy too. You can click on a row. Let me get rid of this more button. By clicking on the row, you get a quick snapshot of, uh, of the record. And then anything in your grid that you pull in here you can create a report. And then I don't use this very often, but there is this button here, <coughs> excuse me, that you can increase your limits um, 
of your grid results if you want, if you choose. So just like any grid in the system, you can sort. And a simple sort on this grid would um, that I often use would be first by date. So just by clicking on, well, let's pull up a purchase order first. Just by clicking on the top row, it's gonna put the, it in order. But I can also shift another column to put in order, say the PO item, by just hitting the shift button and then click on the top of the row. You see that, so now it's sorted first by this, second by this. And you can even go further and I don't know what I could sort on, but you could click another row, shift, hit this row, and then it'll sort this row thirdly. I don't know if you knew that, but that's handy. And then speaking of that advanced query button, um, I'm going to give you an example. The student activity budget summary report showed $800 encumbered. And the advisor called the treasurer's office, can't think of what POs these may be. She thought she closed them all out. What could they be? So the treasurer's office can actually come here to see if they're, what's remaining. So invoiceable true. Get rid of this filter. And you see, I already have like the PO number, what's invoiceable, what's remaining. But I can hit this advanced query button and sort even further down. So I know it's a 200 account. So if I pull in my fund and set it to equals 200, and maybe I'll just do that with the um, special cost center too. Um, and if I pull in the remaining encumbrance, oops, because that's what she wants to know. She wants to find out the PO number with remaining encumbrance greater than zero. So I have that query set up. And so as soon as I hit by query, it's gonna give me the results down here at the bottom, as long as they're invoiceable. So we should find POs in the amount of $800 that would match the budget summary that the advisor talked about. And you can also save it right here and call it, we'll call it student council, save it. So then next year when she calls the, or he or she, the advisor calls, you can pull that up It'll be exactly like you created, apply it. And there's your two POs that are open Oops. Um, for $800. So now you can tell the advisor it was that quick. So I kind of like this. Another, um, oh, and then to hide it or to clear it, say you wanna do another career, query for um, something else or hide these. I'm gonna hide this right now. So I close this box and pull in other um, columns because now I'm gonna show you how to find a, a donation that I know I received in the past. I just can't think of the, the name or the receipt number. And so I come here, I don't no longer need um, like the PO information. So I just deselect those. I will need the receipt number or want to know. Um, and then down by the receipt item, I want the description because that's probably what I entered, um, like the word donation. So I'm going to sort by that. I have the amount and the type. And then my, I might as well do the line number. Okay, so as soon as I click that, as you know, we have a new grid on top with those parameters selected. So receipt, 
description amount type line number. I click on advanced query. Um, first, I want to pick the type, which is the receipt. And then I'm going to pull by date so I can sort by date because I know, <laughs> excuse me, I know it was sometime in 2020. So I'm going to set my operation of greater than. And then lastly, the um, the description. Oops. But this time I'm going to use contains because it could have been a refrigerator donation or cash donation or a pet donation, but the word donation is going to be in there. So again, I could save it and you can see I already did with the same, almost the same parameters. I actually added the fund to on the one that I saved, which is 001. As soon as I apply this, my donations come up. Now I could have probably pulled in who it was, um, who it came from too. So this activity grid is very handy, whether or not you use the um, advanced query, but that, that limits your query because I'm sure you have seen like excessive query result error. All right, any questions on that or anything you'd like to see? All right, so let's see where I am in my notes. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is projects. These are um, used to track projects. There could be like several um, um, pro uh, project to date figures that you want to track. And they're similar to what you see on the screen in the classics reflection period of date fields. This was on the second screen of account screen. And it tracked the beginning balance, receipts, expenditures, and ending balance. So in redesign, it's under core projects. Currently, one cash account can be assigned to the project. I'm going to go back to the instance. So again, core projects. I have a second grade book project that I have set up. Um, Sorry. Okay, so we have familiar icons, view. I'll just bring up the project um, details. I'll come back to that. You have view, edit, delete, and this new button that's called assigned cash account. So let's, creating it would be the same view. So I'm going to view this one. The beginning balance is an optional field. Um, it allows the districts to enter the be beginning cash balance of a project that they're tracking um, for this cash account. So here I put in 6105. The start and stop dates are a must, and you can see how a project can cross fiscal years, and that's the um, advantage of using proje projects. Usually, like an account or a cash account, it just tracks the fiscal year. Projects can go beyond. So as long as these are filled in, your numbers 
are going to populate based on those dates once the account is assigned to a cash account. So you can see there's no account assigned yet. That's why we don't have expended or received numbers in there yet. So to assign those, you would click at this dollar sign. You get a drop down. And if you, if you know your cash account, you can start typing it and it populates as you continue to type. So there's my book project. I click assign. And then when you go back to view the account, you can see these populated. And you can see now it's assigned. And also notice legacy, which is your classic um, files. This came over from classic and it's still tracking those numbers. Oftentimes, I think these are used for more buildings. I just had in this demo, a second grade book project, but for like building projects, stadium, building a stadium project, those kind of things. And then you can attach the um, building construction cash account to it. So you might wonder why or how can these be used in the system? Um, you can add these properties um, related to projects to reports like the budget summary or the revenue summary reports. And instead of flipping back and forth, I am going to go to the PowerPoint. These are possible fields that you can pull in, like that legacy field that I pointed out, legacy period to date expended, or just the period of date expended that has been done in redesign. Again, classic period of date received or period of date received. Oops. When you're on the report properties, you can find those um, properties that you can go ahead and drag over. And then your new budget summary report can include those amounts. Well, that's kind of nice. So that's an example of the budget summary, but it's also um, available like on the revenue side too. I can see period of date received, a period of date received, you pull it over, you put it in your reports and you get it on your revenue summary. So that's how it can be used in reports. And then how it looks like, you can also pull it in grids. So like on the expenditure account, you can pull in these legacy period of date expended. So you, you have them available um, on reports, on grids. Here's an example of the projects in the grids. The project grid in reports. You can see where the report matches what is on the grid which would go back to the account. I realized too late that um, these numbers don't correspond with this and that's just purely an accident. But what would be on the account would be what was in your grid and reports. So you can go to the revenue account and see that be, um, being tracked as well. So you have options with reports by tracking them, um, receipts, expenditures by looking at reports, pulling them in, the grids, or looking on the account. Are there any questions? All right, so. 
Um, Pat, I think what we do, maybe we hold off on taking the break since we're running a little bit early. Um, this is good though, because we um, are gonna do monitor in the session too. Um, so we'll just have to adjust our uh, agenda for next time. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and just keep rolling with our topics and then we'll still take a break at 10.15, I'm thinking. That sounds great. Okay. Um, let me see, let me just get everything pulled up here. Okay. All right, so the next topic that we will um, move into here is talking about the account structure and um, kind of how that connects to reporting. So um, all these pieces are things that, you know, we um, talk about in our beginner training and other trainings, but this is kind of our opportunity to just talk about um, kind of how these things work together and um, some things to think about when you are um, adding certain pieces to grids or reports. So our first thing here um, you know, is considering that account structure. And this can be especially important when you're creating reports that will be used in a CSV or Excel data format. Um, we're gonna look at the fields, I'll pull up the grid here in a minute, but when you're pulling certain fields that come from accounts onto reports, so like a budget summary, um, an appropriation summary, there are amounts that are held within those account pages that are calculated based on, you know, like transactions. So um, I have like, here's how much was expended to this budget account. Obviously that's made up of, you know, expen expense transactions. So I can pull those things to a report. Um, now I have some other functionality when I'm using a PDF report to add control breaks and then have that uh, report mechanism actually give you subtotals. But when you're doing a CSV or Excel data, those don't have the subtotals because that's just pulling raw data to a spreadsheet. So that's where this kind of thing becomes really important because you kind of have to think, you know, which field am I trying to pull from the software in order to get that, um, that report? So um, I have, let's see, properties correspond to the fields available for the chosen object. And um, when we go in and look at these fields on the account page, um, we'll, we'll see that the fields there are actually, like they connect to what you're pulling um, when you go to actually edit that report definition. Basically, just like what Pat showed with the projects. So you had those fields on the project page for project to date and then the legacy project to date. And so when you're adding that you know, to those reports, it's coming directly from that field. Um, so let's see, so let me switch over here. Make sure we got you, SAS. Okay. I hope this is zoomed in enough. Um, if anybody needs me to zoom in a little bit more on this page, just let me know in the chat. Um, okay. So we start off on our fund grid. And if I were to look at one of these, um, if I were to go and open one of these records, I'm looking specifically at um, fields that are calculated at the fund level. So for everything that qualifies for the fund code 001, those are included in these totals. If I go pull a report then that um, is for the fund information, um, and when you're when you're creating reports, you always have that object in the top. Uh, like if you were to use the custom report creator, or if you edit a report, you can see what the report object is. So if my report object is fund, then I'm pulling right these fields right from this page. When I go to the expenditure grid, this is where my budget information comes from. So stuff so for my budget summary. Um, when I look at um, one of uh, these accounts and um, I'm just gonna pick the first one though I probably should have um, grabbed one with some figures, but it's okay. Um, so I have, you know, fund, function, object, all of these things I could put um, on a report. Uh, if I am looking at um, a budget summary, and I have 
the um, you know expendable, the fiscal today expendable total. What shows on a budget summary for this account is whatever is going to show in this field. They're directly related. Now, where this becomes important is that when you're building reports or when you're adding columns to grids in redesign, um, you have some flexibility so that you can kind of connect to other pages. And that allows you to include some um, you know, different kinds of reports, some different information. So if I use this more option, I can see here um, things that I, and you know what, let me try and open both of these at the same time. Okay. So when I use this more option, I can see on my grid, I'm able to include any of these code pieces. Again, coming right from here. Fun function object, okay, boom. Um, and that's what's gonna show in that row is based on this information. When I scroll down here, I have amounts. So these amounts um, expended, these are coming from um, these fields. And then see, I have fiscal month calendar. So those correspond. Um, with the expenditure account, this one's a little bit unique because it does connect to budget information with the, with the nature of the expenditure account. So if I were to open the budget field, like this all is gonna connect directly to an expenditure account as well. Um, However, and this is where this is where it gets a little bit tricky and what we're trying to watch out for with this is the cash account section here is what I'm talking about when I say, you know, we can connect to some other types of accounts to bring over some additional information. Um, so as soon as I open this section, I mean, opening it doesn't do anything, but once I open it, anything that I grab from this section is no longer coming from this page. It's now actually coming from, if I go to the cash account grid, and open that, open a record there um, for the 001 for, for this one, it's gonna pull it from that page instead because I'm kind of connecting over. Um, there can definitely be times where that's very helpful, especially with report building. Um, so that connection is actually the way that you can have cash balances in the headers um, on your, um, you know, on certain reports, but, um, for the purpose of grids, let me show you this. If we go to the amounts and let's say we want to add the, um, let's do the fiscal today expended. And then I'm going to close out this more optional reload my grid for me. Um, but I'm grabbing this from the cash account. So um, this is what you got to watch out for because if we come back to this expenditure grid, I'm taking just a minute here and I'm gonna scroll over. Since I added this from the cash account, well, all of these have the same cash account. All of these are fund 001 with a special cost center of zero. So this amount is exactly the same for all of these because it's the cash account figure. Um, if you add something like this to your grid, um, that is a field that A is pulling from another page and B is calculating for the cash account for all of those lines. So I would definitely watch out for this. Uh, you know, this isn't something that I would recommend like leaving on a grid. This is something you want to kind of be careful with with your users because um, it will add to the loading time, um, especially if you have multiple of these fields. So what I would recommend instead is, you know, if you're wanting to see this, um, so let's, you know, we'll leave it on there because we're in our test land and we're going to hop around. Um, but if we come to the cash account grid, and then instead add it here, this would be a better way to view that. Um, so now that I'm on the cash account grid, then when I'm over here, my amounts are cash account amounts and I could add the fiscal to date expended here. And this would be a, kind of like a, basically just a more efficient way to view this um, instead of having it you know, added to every single line. And let me just check my notes, make sure we got everything there. Okay, so we are, we're, we're gonna jump over to the report then and look at it there. Uh, so if I go to the report manager, and let's get that budget summary. Let's edit this. 
Okay, so first the select object, this is what I'm talking about when I say, you know, this corresponds to like basically what this, what, this is what your primary grid is that you're pulling information from. You're just pulling it to a report. Um, if I uh, open this up here, I can see that I do have, um, let's see, a cash account. This would pull from my cash account grid. Um, and I would have, uh, you know, fund, um, revenue, appropriation, et cetera. So this uh, properties on the left, kind of same idea as the more option when you're on that grid is things that are like kind of like primary. So if I can go directly to code, this is gonna be coming right from that expenditure grid. But if I have to drill down a step first and go into cash account, and then, you know, code or amounts, this is where this information is going to be coming from the cash account. And so if I, you know, were to add the expended from this section, same result as what I'm seeing on the grid. Um, now I can, if there's a reason that you, you know, that you want to see those on there. Um, again, I think probably in a header would be helpful. Um, so, you know, on this report, you have it summarized by cash account if you wanted to add then you know so it had like the initial balance and the ending balance if you're running that for a fiscal year um you know that's this is why they're available but it's just basically like thinking about how you're using those and um, making sure you're using them in an efficient way and um one of the reasons that that i bring this up again kind of connects back to if you are running something in uh to csv or to excel data uh keep in mind that things like the headers and the subtotals aren't necessarily going to come over. So um, we're looking at, okay, I can add, you know, this total that is for the cash account. Now, if I'm doing a subtotal on the PDF version of my budget summary, I could have here are all the expendable um, or all the ex uh, expenditure accounts, here are all my budget accounts. And here is my fiscal today expended for each one of those accounts. So when I make a total of that, that should equal what my cash account expended total is. And it will, um, but you can only get that subtotal if you're doing a PDF. So if you're looking for an Excel version of what those cash account um, expended amounts or the totals are, that's where I would wanna go find a report that is built off of this cash account object and then run my CSV from there. Um, and let's switch back over to this. I know it's kind of a lot. I hope I didn't uh, run through that too fast for you. Um, but I know we've talked a, you know, a bit about the, um, the different accounts, the different um reporting options you know in the past so kind of just wanted to like review this talk it through definitely if you guys have questions let me know and we do have screenshots of this you know in the powerpoint this as well okay so i'm sure some of you have seen this you know a bunch of times I, you know if if you're newer this might not be something that you know come across all that often when I started learning accounts, this right here was super helpful to me. So um, if this is something um, that, you know, that you may not be, um, may not have seen, you know, very often, or um, I don't know, this is something that I would save um, if, if you're in the situation where you're learning accounts more. So basically what we're seeing here is when I'm looking at that expenditure grid, I have a whole list of expenditure accounts. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so this is my whole grid. Now, each of these expenditure accounts, based on the account codes, they get categorized into an appropriation account. So my appropriation account might be uh, 001 is my fund, and then functions that start with 11 and then um, certain object code parameters. And so each expenditure account will fall into an appropriation. And then the appropriation accounts based on the fund and the special cost center will fall under a cash account. And so this is what, this is basically what it's following when we looked at that um, expenditure grid and I said, I'm adding, um, I'm adding this, 
uh, fiscal today expended total from the cash, and it was the same for all of my expenditure accounts. Well, that's because if you look at this, all of these expenditures are from the same cash if they have the same fund special cost center as that cash the cash count so the fund special cost center so if i had so i was looking at the general fund so if i had a grant account um that was a 500 uh you know 516 and then the special cost center is 9921 for fiscal year 21 then any of the expenditure accounts that have that same fund special cost center will fall under that and then any totals that you add for the related cash account will be the same for all of those expenditure accounts Revenue also falls under cash. So revenue instead of the expended is the received amounts. So, um, you know, we looked at our example with the fiscal today expended, but if you went to the, um, the revenue uh, account grid and added the um, fiscal to date received, again, those would be the same for everything, all of the revenue accounts that have that same cash account. I'm very visual um, charts and stuff, you know, this works. So, so that's probably why I'm such a big fan of this, <laughs> but um, I want to make sure that was included. Okay. Um, so let's see. So that is, that covers, let me just double check here. Oh, um, the last thing I want to mention, and, you know, we're kind of already talking about this with, I'm editing the reports and the control breaks, but when you're actually generating the report, um, you have you know your sort options or whatever it's set up with. The control break is what's going to determine what's the header and what's the subtotal. Now, a lot of people like to use these summary reports. Very, very handy, excellent when you're generating PDFs, but the summary report option here, what that does is it's only showing them headers, and the totals and the subtotals that relies directly on the control breaks. So if you're trying to use a summary report, this needs to be um, it's limited to like what what formats that actually works in. So like, you know, PDF, regular Excel, but if I want a raw data report, if I want Excel data or um, a comma separated values, you're not going to be seeing what you would see in a summary report. This is not this is not giving you um, those direct pieces. So if I'm running Excel data, it's pointless to have this summary report that's not going to make any difference basically on that data type on that format. Um, okay, so that's all I have about the accounts and reporting, um, you know, certainly if you have questions throw them out there, but I'm going to kind of switch gears here to talk about pending transactions. Um, if we're good to go there. Okay, so uh, let's switch over. Okay, so for the pending transactions, um, this is where the information is coming over, uh, basically from the payroll side, from USPR, uh, I'm sorry, USPSR. <laughs> um, the they'll post uh, transactions um, related to payroll, employer distribution, employer retirement share. And from that side, what they can do is they can generate files to send to USAS. And this gives the USAS side a way to be able to review and then add that data to the USAS um, totals to the books. Um, when you are posting uh, employer distribution, or employer retirement. So this is like your classic board dis or board ret. Um, those files would go to a PO once they're posted from the pending transactions. The payroll file, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, uh, the payroll file will go directly to a disbursement. So that one, um, you know, you want to be careful, uh, A, like when you're posting, um, you know, what the date is being used, uh, but also if there is a situation where you need to avoid that one, uh, definitely always recommend caution with that because you don't have a PO anymore in redesign that you can just kind of like, you know, doctor and repost. So um, how I like to do this section is 
we kind of have some questions, some common questions that we've gotten about pending transactions. And so I'm going to kind of go through um, and talk about, you know, the questions that come up a little bit and then kind of um, organize, you know, what we're talking about with looking at these through that. So let's go back to our instance and um, we're looking under transaction. and uh, pending transactions. So I've already got a bunch in here. I do have a USPS instance and let's go ahead and refresh this because we're gonna need to log in there. Um, I do have a USPS instance and we'll hop to this. I'll do my best to try and make sure we're noting when we're in USAS versus USPS. Um, but I have pushed over a bunch of files here that we have the ability to work with. Um, the type uh, column is very helpful. So this distribution, employer distribution. So what that is, that is employer paid amounts related to payroll. So the board, the board paid. Um, and these have um, an interesting description, but these are basically, uh, for my example, uh, STRS and SERS board amounts. Um, alternatively, you may have the um, SERS and STRS retirement share. If they were to use that, um, then it would look more like this. And um, I'll review real quick the difference between like pulling those in USPS. And then I have a payroll file here as well. So the type is going to tell me, you know, which type of um, posting it is. And I guess let's just hop over to here and get logged in. Um, now I'm in USPS uh, under the USAS integration. This is where they're able to pull the employer distribution submission. And, um, you know, for my example, for both, I did use the SERS and STRS uh, account codes, but if they had something else, you know, if there was like, um, you know, health insurance or uh, Medicare, like that sort of thing that they had set up and they wanted to post employer amounts for, they would just, um, you know, find the appropriate code, move it over, and then they would, you know, generate the submission and submit it to, um, to USAS. There's a button down here once they have the proper information. So that's where these files are coming from. Um, okay. So let's open one of these up because I want to take a look at what comes over. And this is where we are going to kind of hop back and forth, but I want to talk about where this information is coming from. So uh, this is one of my postings. Um, the date comes over from the date that I created this pending transaction file by pushing it from USPS to USAS, um, at least in the view that we're seeing here. I have a description, the total amount, um, and then I have this payee information. So I have um, my address information and I have a payee name. And um, we'll go look at where this, this is coming directly from USPS from the setup that they've put up, that they've set up in there. The start and stop date, this connects to um, when I switch back to USPS here, start and stop dates from when I generate this file and send it over. Uh, that's what these start and stop dates are. And then here's the detailed information of what it would post. Okay, so back to USPS. Um, if I were to go to the core menu in USPS and let's start with the payroll item configuration. So um, this file I generated, I think I'm looking at the one that was, let me just double check here. Um, make sure it was the 400. No, it was the 450. Oops. I knew I had both of them in there. Um, okay, so the 450. So this is my STRS record, uh, my payroll item that was created um, over here in, in USPS. And um, each one of these is like your old deduction code. It's now called payroll item. Um, and I probably will say deduction at some point or deduction code. And um, I mean payroll item. <laughs> uh, but you have your payee information down here and um, we'll see right where this is coming from, but this is our kind of our first look at, okay, here's the information that we're seeing in USAS, you know, it, it's connected because this is the code that I pulled. 
And um, also in my core menu, I have a setup for payees. And this is what determines the list of what they can pick on that configuration. So Folkston Industries, I thought this one was an easy one to pick because it's just like my last name. I was like, oh, I'm never gonna forget this. <laughs> so um, Folkston Industries is our payee. And when we open this up, we can view, we can edit, but um, here is the name of this payee. Here is the address information. And when I go back to my use as pending transaction, we see, boom, here's the address. Here's the, um, here's the name of the payee. And so this is exactly where this information is coming from. So if this needs to change, this is your first, you know, this is a good spot to start. Um, and we'll kind of see how this works with the use as vendors in a minute too. But um, it is kind of nice because, you know, this might be managed by, you know, your payroll, your payroll side, the payroll department. Um, they're the ones that are getting this information. And then you're simply just kind of posting expenses to the USAS side, you know, when you're over there with the pending transactions. So this information can be updated. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to leave this the same because my, um, I'm going to leave this the same for now. Um, but I do want to talk about this electronic payment flag. So this kind of stands out to me because, you know, now we're looking at posting this as, um, you know, a PO on the USAS side, we're going to follow through that process and, and post it as an expense. And do we want it to be electronic, like a memo check? Or do we want it to actually create a check because we actually need to send something out for this? Um, I will say like star, uh, this box is not where you do it. We are in USPS. So this is not going to impact the check on the USAS side. So even though I wanna keep this address information up to date for my board paid, and this is specifically for the board paid ones that I'm pushing over to USAS, this checkbox is not is not it. Um, however, on the USPS side for the employee paid um, payroll items when they're actually cutting the outstanding payables through USPS, that's what they're using. So that's why it's showing on all of these payees uh, but for the purpose of pending transactions, we don't need to worry about that. That's not going to make a difference. Uh, so I'll go ahead and save this up. Um, we'll hop out of there. Okay, so now to you, SAS. How does this work with when we're posting these? Um, first, let's go ahead and click the post button. So all I've done so far is click this little icon to open this up, and I'm clicking to post. When I do that, uh, now I have a pop-up with some additional options. First thing is this transaction date. So the transaction date, and I'm doing a distribution, so this is gonna create a PO. So I want my transaction, the PO, uh, let's put it in, um, I believe we still have August open. Um, we switched to July, but um, August should be available for us to post to. So I'm going to change that date. And then the payee vendor. Okay. So here, um, if you were to leave this payee vendor blank, um, what this will do is it will create a PO, but it's also going to be blank. So before you're able to go ahead and invoice that PO and then pay it, you'll have to select a vendor there. Um, alternatively, you can select the vendor here. So one of the two, if, if you're not sure at the time of the pending transaction, want to leave that blank and double check and then add it to the actual purchase order, you can do that. Um, but this will allow you to select um, a payee vendor here. And I do have some vendors that are Folkston. I have a couple different, couple different types. See, this is Folkston Industries. So um, I'm just going to pick this one here, 5351. Let me make sure I write that down because I've been testing with a different one when I was preparing. So we don't want to lose that. Okay, 
So if we select this, say this is what we want. Um, yeah, just, I told you I was testing with a different one. <laughs> so we're going to ignore that. Um, so I'm going to select this one so that we can actually see uh, what this is doing here. But um, so I select my vendor and uh, let's see. So this box we'll talk about in a minute. I have another one I'm going to post here. I have um, I have a couple of versions of this same transaction that we can post to see the different behavior. Um, but let's go ahead. We'll leave this box unchecked. Apply payee name and address to vendor. We'll see that in our next example, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what it does. Um, but let's go ahead. I'm going to open. Okay, we're doing a second use as tab because we wanna look at two things at once. Um, I just wanna to go to, let's get our vendor open and look at it here. So 5351, okay. Folks did insurance. So we have the name, um, but we also have the location. This is the check information down here being used for the check. Folks did insurance, here is the address. Um, so just so we can kind of connect, boom, folks did insurance. Here's the address. Let's go ahead and post this one. And sometimes, you know, these are pretty big. Um, pulling these for a lot of employees, we can see there's a lot of accounts that were included here. So that, you know, that is pretty normal for that to take um, kind of a minute there how it did. And I'm gonna go transaction purchase orders. That was a distribution. So that posted a purchase order. Uh, here it is. Let's take a look. And uh, boom, here's the date that I input when I posted that pending transaction. Here's the vendor that I selected. And here's all of my um, information that came over uh, based on the accounts that were in that file that pulled from USPS. I can edit this uh, if I find, you know, okay, something that posted from USPS, I need to switch around some of the amounts that were charged. Um, you know, if I wanted to um, add anything up here, I am able to go ahead and, and edit and save that, you know, before I invoice it. And let's go, oh, not purchase orders. We wanna go back to pending transactions. Go to our pending transactions. All right, so now this one, excuse me, um, this is the same, I just, I basically just generated two of these files um, for the employer distribution, the same one, just so that we could kind of see this a couple different ways. So again, uh, same information. This is, again, is coming from the payee for the same dates. Um, so let's go ahead and look at our post window again. Change that to an eight. Okay. Now, um, let me go ahead, let's pick our um, updated vendor and let me just uh, close those. So uh, here's the vendor that we wanna use. This apply payee name and address to vendor. So what this is going to do um, is if I check this box, it's going to take this information right here, line one, uh, I'm sorry, line like name one, I'm sorry. <laughs> It'll take the name, it'll take the address line one, address line two, city and state. Um, and then it's going to actually update our vendor location with that information. So um, again, sorry for hopping around, but um, here's USPS. So if I, on the payroll side, um, oh, I got an updated address for where we need to send this information related to this payroll item. I would go to that payee as the payroll person and update this, but what this checkbox does on the USAS side is if that was updated, it makes sure that the um, USAS side, the accounting check, is going to actually have that same information as well. Um, so just to make it a little bit easier, especially if there's different departments, and so one person might get that information and the other person may not. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll do the same thing. Keep that checked. We'll post this. Uh, 
Okay. And we'll get rid of our little error here, um, our warnings. And then let's go back. So I'm gonna have to close this out. Let's let's refresh this page. But this was our vendor. This is our vendor grid now in USAS. And 5351. Boom. Okay. So now when we look at this, it still says Folkestone Insurance up here because that's my vendor primary name. So it's not changing that. But I do have a payee ID that it links it to. And it changed my location name. So what's going to show on the check, um, the name, and then look, now we're Warwick Drive. So instead of like the 999 South, um, South Drive or, or whatever it was, uh, that's going to go ahead and change this now so that it's consistent with what was showing in USPS. Um, honestly, uh, this was also the reason that we were getting the errors because I had tried this as an example with like a different vendor um, when, I, when I was preparing. And so then when I went to try and like choose a different vendor, um, it was saying, hey, I see that one of your vendors already has this payee ID. Are you sure you want to use a different vendor? So that's kind of convenient as well, um, because if there's something they commonly use, they would get a warning if they're you know suddenly using a different one. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so we did talk about the electronic payment. Um, ah, all right. Let's look at, okay. I'm back to USPS, uh, real quick here. And again, we're on our payee information. The other thing here is it has a number. Um, now in classic, how it used to work when they were setting up the deductions, like the dead names, is they could enter a vendor number there and it would pull in the information from the vendor file and kind of like populate uh, the information for them. But so like there was a kind of a reason to put that vendor number in. Um, here, they do enter the payee information um, themselves. If they wanted to put the related vendor number, um, they could. But um, it's not necessarily like it's not it's not you know required is not necessarily needed. Uh, what that would do is let's look at a different one. So again, I'm in my uh, pending transactions. Is I have this payee number field. So if it is being linked to a vendor and you want to have that number there, just so that there's a reference to make sure, you know, okay, yes, this is the payee um, number. This is, so this is the vendor I want to use. That's an option. Um, again, it does link with the payee ID, but it kind of depends on the district. Like maybe, you know, the person who is, who is managing those payees in USPS does look at the vendor in USAS, you know, maybe they have a view only and I don't know. So maybe they're keeping track of that in some way. And if they did want that to be different, they would have a way to enter that. Um, but again, it's not really necessary. It's not really um, impacting anything because um, really the point when the vendor gets selected is either here. And actually, you know what? Let's let's post this one without a payee vendor um, so we can see what that looks like. Uh, so um, the vendor is either getting selected here or on the actual purchase order. So regardless if that has a payee number or not, uh, it's not really going to, to impact, you know, what's happening in USAS. It's, it's more for reference. Uh, so let's see. So 813, here's the one that I just posted. So if I open this up and look, I don't have a vendor because I did not select a payee vendor when I posted that pending transaction. And so before I were to invoice, I would come in here and then find, you know, um, if I had one of these in here and I could select the appropriate vendor and then save and continue. Um, okay, so um, if they are, the last thing just about that, um, the number is if they are um, setting one of these up, you know, the number, again, it's a good reference for USAS if they want to use it, but also if this does happen to be an employee paid um, deduction that 
they're cutting the check through USPS, then they don't need it um, for that either. So just kind of like a side note. Um, okay, so those are my notes, at least for the pending transactions for employer distribution part. Um, so that classic like board disc piece. We have some more to talk about with the employer retirement share. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the payroll posting, but it is um, a little bit, now it's 10, 16, but I think it's about break time. So let's take like, let's take like a five minute break. Um, and uh, actually let's take, let's take a little bit more. So it's 10, 16, let's get started at 10, 25. So like that's nine minutes, but a chance for everyone to stretch your legs, um, refill your coffee, um, that sort of thing. And then we will uh, get back rolling into some more pending transactions. And then we're going to hop into um, some more of the system admin tools. And Pat, I'm not sure if you're able to pause the recording. I'm not seeing where I can do that, so. Start. All right. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and get started again. Um, uh, one more thing, let me just pop up my little chat window in case you guys have questions. Um, so um, on our slide here, we, uh, we hit all of these things with the employer distribution submission. Um, back to this. So next we'll talk about the employer retirement share submission. Um, these can be generated in uh, USPS and let's go back. So here's our instances. Um, this one USPS under the USAS integration. Employer retirement share is an option on there. Now actually I should mention that both of these options are added here based on modules in USPS. So they do have to have these turned on. Um, not all districts may use the employer retirement share. Kind of just depends on how they do it, um, if they want that um, option available. But this allows them to enter a date range for, um, for like a payroll. Usually I think they do this by the month. And then um, they're able to enter their full like STRS and SERS amounts to distribute. And this will allocate that to the accounts, uh, the benefit accounts that are associated with what was paid through payroll. So once they do that, again, they have like submit to, uh, to USAS. And that's where we get these entries um, in the pending transactions. So that's where um, that's going to come from. And um, basically, it's going to be the same procedure as what we just talked through with the um, employer distributions. So I could post this here. I would be able to select a vendor if I needed to update vendor information based on the USPS payee, um, this box works the same. So, uh, you know, we don't not necessarily gonna go through um, all of that again, but um, you know, that's just kind of what that looks like. I do have a note. So these account codes, are generated um, you know, in the USPS side when they're running that employer distribution. And uh, let's hop back to USPS for a minute. Uh, when I you know, enter my dates here and create the um, preview, that'll show me the accounts that are used. Uh, there is also a report for both employer distribution and retirement share that they could generate on the USPS side ahead of time that will show not only the amounts, but it would show the accounts that would be set to be charged. So um, I would, you know, they should be looking at that, I think before creating the file and sending it over. But, you know, if you're on the USAS side and you see, hey, like something's off with these accounts or have a question about it, uh, there are reports that could be run to look at where that information is coming from. And um, the note that I have here is to keep in mind, so employer retirement share is, um, grabbing accounts to disperse um, or to distribute STRS and SERS amounts. Those are very specific to account codes that are either certified or classified. Um, and that uh, corresponds right to the object code that is used. 
So um, again, back to USAS, here's my account codes. So I have my object codes um, here that are corresponding to um, you know, either certified or classified. Well, what those get generated and based on is the pay account that is used and then what the configuration is um, on the USPS side. But uh, that's a little bit different. So just because it's for SERS, if they were paid out of a different type of account and it could be like certified, classified or other, but like say they were paid out of an account code that's technically coded as other in the USAS manual, then whatever object is set to be for like other accounts um, in the USPS setup will be used. So that one's a little bit, you know, when there's a specific example, um, you know, if it's something you're working through, it makes a little bit more sense when you're looking at like actual um, situation. But what I, what I want to do in mentioning this is, you know, if a district is generating this and they're like, hey, these accounts don't make sense for why they're on the SERS posting, if it's for a certified object code, go look at the pay account. That's what you want to, that's what it's being based on. And, and that's really the key there. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, I guess we could just talk about real quick, if this is something, um, say we already posted and we don't want this, we could reject it, give a rejection reason, and then that would clear this out of the grid. So if it's something that's out there and you don't need, uh, that is an option as well. And that's the same for the distribution. So let's clean this up. Let's reject this one. Nope. <laughs> Um, and then, um, and then that's going to go ahead and, and reject this, um, and just clear it out of the script basically. Um, okay. So let's move on to payroll. Um, okay. When we go ahead, let's open this up, um, with our little view and again, same options, post reject or, uh, validate this. Uh, but you can see we have some different information than what we had with the um, retirement share and the distribution postings. Uh, we have the date, we have the description, the total, the pay date. And then this is basically your information from the payroll side of like when the payroll was um, initialized, when it was set up. Here's the information that um, was from there. And then you have your um, account codes. This total is the gross payroll um, because that's what needs to be posted to the USAS side um, to the books. And when we click post, we do not have the same options as with the distribution. So this is a bit different. Um, the first thing, big highlight here, electronic. This is checked by default. So what that means is this is going to make a distribution. Um, I'm sorry, a disbursement. This is gonna make a disbursement. It's going to make basically a check. It's posting this right to the books. If you leave it checked electronic, it's going to basically be a memo check. If they need this to be a physical check that they can print and um, with a check number, then this needs to be unchecked at this step. This is the time to do it. Uh, the transaction date, again, this is gonna be the date for the disbursement. So um, let's change that to an open period. And then the bank account. So this works the same way as how they would utilize bank accounts normally with um, disbursements within their USAS system. So if they just have like a default bank account, they can leave it to that. If they have multiple, you know, maybe they have a payroll bank account that they're associating those checks with. Um, and then, you know, they'd want to change that here. So let's go ahead and post this. We get our um, negative balance warnings. And then um, if I go to my purchase orders grid, this is where I went last time I had, okay, here's my, um, my um, employer distributions. Here were the ones from that. I do not have a PO associated with the payroll. Um, no longer a thing. So, so I go right to my disbursements grid and um, I can see it right here. Let's look at this. 
The other thing that you'll notice, and you can see it right on this grid, is there is no vendor associated with the payroll um, disbursement. And there's not. Uh, you, you don't select one um, at that step when you're posting the pending transaction. Um, there's not a vendor associated with it. This is the way that it's able to post the <laughs> payroll to the books. Um, but it's not actually it's not actually going to attach a vendor. What it can use is the payee name and address that we're seeing on this pop-up. So um, this is coming from USPS. It's got the school name, it's got the address, and um, that would be that would be used for like if you were to um, generate this as a check. And um, let's see. So Um, and, and I'm sorry, and just in case I didn't specifically say it, so this is the organization uh, name and address. Um, the other thing and why, you know, I stress so hard that there's not uh, no longer a PO and, and really like there's, that's basically just skipping a step. It's something that like there was POs in classic, but it didn't really make sense. Like, you know, you're really just posting um, to your books, it saves some steps because, you know, like with the employer distribution, you know, that is kind of just a way to make it easier to create the PO to post those amounts. But in this case, like this is the payroll. This is what has been paid out to the employees already. You know, here's the gross amounts and you're needing to post those to the books. So this isn't necessarily something that you're actually taking through the expenditure process. So that's kind of why um, that's gone. But what you want to be careful of is if this gets posted with the wrong date or, you know, they didn't want it to be electronic and it was electronic, uh, the timing of voiding this payroll disbursement and then recreating it is very important. Um, if I just void this right now and um, it's from like a prior payroll and the outstanding um, payables on the USPS side have already been paid, that's in the books. I can't just generate another file because USPS thinks, okay, it's already been posted, it's already been sent. So um, there are cases where if you just void this and you don't have a way to regenerate and repost, like they might have to manually recreate a posting file. And of course you wanna avoid that. So the time that you can void is if you had the payroll. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to the payroll side. So if I had a payroll that um, when I go to the detail of this payroll, if I haven't done my outstanding payables yet and I have the option to unpost this payroll and then repost it, then I would be able to go ahead and submit another payroll submission over. If they are past that point, that's when you're gonna have to look at other options. So. Um, just something that's like really, you know, there are definitely ways um, to do it. You know, sometimes it would need to be done, but um, certainly if you come into a situation like that, um, if your district comes into a situation like that, you know, you're at the ITC, they're, they're asking about it. Like I would just, you know, I always kind of recommend caution before you're just going in to the USAS disbursement grid and voiding out um, a payroll disbursement. And then um, I kind of pointed it out here, but you know, you'll notice with this type, uh, this is the disbursement type. Uh, those are all marked as payroll, so they are um, pretty easy to look up and locate, um, you know, if they're trying to go look at all of their payroll postings. And let's see, okay, so employer retirement. Here is the slide for payroll. And I think we, I think we talked about all of this. Um, yeah, doing pretty good here. Okay, so we're ready to hop into the modules and this is where it gets a little bit more on like the system admin side. Um, do we have any questions about the payroll, uh, I'm sorry, the pending transactions before we move on? Okay. Well, we are rolling right through then. Um, let's see, where are we at? 1045, yeah, we're, we're ahead of schedule. I did have, we did add in the monitor section. So I'm interested to see, we may still go till noon, um, even though we're kind of ahead here. So just a heads up. 
Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through these different modules and talk about um, kind of the basics of what each one is for. So the first one is the ACH uh, processing module. And um, again, I'm going to hop back to the software here. Let's We're getting out of USPS. So um, thanks for bearing with me while we hop back and forth. But I really like to look at, you know, where information, how it's connecting um, for that pending transaction part. Um, so let's get out of there. This was our extra UCES um, screen, Oop, and I probably shouldn't have logged out of there. So we'll have to refresh this one. Um, okay, so now we're just in UCES. I'm going to system modules. Now, a lot of these modules, I mean, this is a place that you'll visit um, as an ITC when you are migrating the district. You're going to come in here. You know, there are certain things you may turn on. Um, you know, and for some districts, like, you may not need to come back here, you know, very often, if at all. But um, some of these, we're just going to talk about what each one does, because if this is something that you're looking for, um, certain fields or something you may need to use, uh, generally, a module is like the first step to getting, um, you know, certain pieces of the software set up. So ACH processing module is our first one. And um, when we go ahead and turn this on, um, all we have to do is click that plus, it'll show us if it's installed. And then, you know, it'll tell us if it needs like a page refresh, um, or some of these, uh, I have a list in the PowerPoint, um, actually do need a restart um, if they're kind of like a bigger change. But what this is doing, if I go to my vendors, is this is going to, and let's go ahead and edit so we can see easier. Um, it's gonna add this section for ACH info. So it's gonna add these fields um, where you could enter the bank account number, the routing number, deposit type, um, all of these things that can be used to generate an ACH file. Right now, and still, like there is not an actual option through USAS to make an ACH file. So um, that's something I mean we, we would want to do in the future. But you know, at this point, still, like you're not actually making an ACH file through USAS. Uh, these fields are basically um, we uh, we put a spot here for them so that there's a place to enter this information, like there was in Classic. And then this information can be include, can be included on an XML file when you're making a disbursement, like printing checks, basically. And since we also include this information that you can put in these fields, the third party can take that and make it into an ACH file. So that's what these are for. Um, and that's what that module turns that on so that, um, you know, if they're generating uh, the ACH file through a third party like Edge. Um, Edge would create these and it would be able to use these fields to do so. A big note, the ACH active flag, this isn't something that's like specifically used by Edge. This is something just within our software that can be used for um, like easy, like sort and filtering of grids. So if you're entering information in here, then you wanna check and you want, you know, if you wanna check this as active, then on your grid, on your vendor grid, um, or on a report, you would be able to filter that to say, okay, here's my active ones, here's my non-active ones. And that's basically just like a reporting mechanism. Um, that is important to note because that's something that, you know, maybe we will use uh, in the future in the software when the ACH file is generated there. But right now, since it's not generated there, like Edge doesn't really care about that. So if they uncheck that box, but leave all of that information populated, a third party may not say, oh, that's inactive. Um, and what we found is they don't. So, you know, that just kind of a note because, um, and we've talked to them about, about that field, but um, how it stands right now, you know, this is, this is for informational purposes within our software. Um, okay, so let's go back to our modules. And you know what? Let's do this so that I can hop around and we don't keep going back and forth. I lied. We're, we're opening another tab. Um, I'm just going to open this second tab so that we can keep our uh, modules page open um, and kind of bop through here. So accounts receivable module. Um, so the accounts receivable module we added last summer. 
And um, so that's with like the AR information. If they um, wanted to use that, they would basically turn this on and then it's going to add a menu option up here with all of the um, different AR pages. So customers, billings, uh, payments, all related to AR, you would actually have an additional drop down up here with all of that. And I could add that just by clicking this plus. Um, okay, the classic requisition approval module. So for this one, I'm going to go to my PowerPoint. So what this is going to do is it's going to enable on your requisition record. So in transaction requisition, it's going to enable a couple fields, um, approval status and workflow context fields. This specific module, um, these options are used for third party software that is sending information back to redesign. So uh, not all third party requisition approvals do this. Um, some of them are one way, like, for example, RAM is something that's a one way communication. It's just, you know, sending requisitions to get approved there, but RAM doesn't send information back to USAS. So this would be just with specific um requisition approvals um or like softwares this also is not the new workflows requisition approval that that we've created through ssdt uh that is a separate module that we'll talk about so this is you know kind of a very specific situation um but it adds the approval status and then um it adds like transmitted status is like another field um that can be added to the po Uh, the next one is the EIS integration. So this adds the um, EIS uh, classic configuration to the system. So basically, if they are um, going to be using inventory, I'm not sure if we are updating this uh, configuration um, name because it says EIS classic integration because the threshold um, and the automatic is still going to apply if they're using the redesign inventory um, now. So um, I'd say that you would still want this on because um, this is basically going to determine, you know, what uh, items, what invoice items are qualifying to be marked as um, marked for the EIS pending file. So it's gonna look at this threshold and then it's going to look at the object code. And when they're invoicing, there's a little checkbox that it'll use to say, yes, this should be included in the EIS pending um, extract. And um, so previously that would have been in the extract report, um, but the new inventory uh, system uh, actually has like a way to pull it directly into a pending file. Email notification services. So this one, um, pretty important. Uh, I mean, basically if they're wanting to have any kind of like emails be going out of USAS, they're gonna have to configure this. Honestly, I think this one's probably something that'll be set up, you know, when they're migrated. Uh, certainly for USPS, like this one gets set up definitely right away because usually districts are sending uh, direct deposit. Um, emails. But in USAS, you can send uh, report emails, you can set up those report bundles, or even just like a cron job to send an email um, with certain reports. Uh, if they do end up using workflows, the uh, email notifications for the requisition approvals, those would rely on this. So just basically, basically, if they're going to be having the USAS system send any kind of um, any kind of email out, this does need to be configured. And um, I'll go ahead and look at this one. So email notification services, so they would turn this on. And then we'll go to the system. Oh, you know what, let's go on the other page. I said, I said we're staying here. So system configuration. And you have this email configuration option here. And um, so when you open this up, um, so basically the default administrator address and the default from address. So I would definitely fill this one out default from address. And this can be, um, honestly, it kind of depends. Like 
per ITC per district, like what this might be, um, because I'm sure that your technology um, departments have like certain um, parameters in place for emails that can send using um, using their information. So like for us, um, if I were to set this up, we go through, we use port and um, SMTP information through management council. So my from address has to be at MCOECN um, in order to be able to send. So for your ITC or your district, like if it's coming from the district, it might have to be at their district dot edu or you know whatever it is dot gov whatever it is um i think it's anyways um but it would have to be like at their domain in order to maybe use uh to send emails from there and usually that's like a spam filter thing so when you're setting this up i mean my recommendation is check with your tech team um they'll be able to help with what that from address um, would need to be as well as this port and smtp information um the password and username fields are here. I've never had to use those uh, for setting this up, you know, either for testing or for actually for districts um, when I used to do that. But that may be a thing, again, like another security measure if, um, you know, access to be able to send using this information um, requires additional credentials. Um, as far as the different default um, addresses up here, so the default from address, you want to enter that in. Default administrator address um, is not, uh, not necessarily used right now. So that's a field that may be used in the future. You could put the same you know, email address in both, but at this time there isn't a specific difference between those. So um, I wouldn't worry about that one. Also this field, the enabled start, um, that is another field that is something um, in the background. I just leave that alone. Um, I know I've talked to our team about that. I think we have a JIRA issue to um, hide that from view, but uh, don't worry about that one either. <laughs> okay. So let's go to our next one is the legacy password migration. Now, when a district migrates from classic to redesign, the general practice is to just manually set the new passwords. Um, you know, I mean, it really depends, like for most districts, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much the way to go. Um, I know that with bigger districts though, sometimes that's not always something that, um, that you'd wanna do. The thing is that the way the passwords were coded in classic, it's not possible to actually bring the passwords over. And so that's why, you know, um, you can set new ones. Like, I don't know, way back when, like I used to set them where uh, it was like, kind of the same password for everybody. And then we'd hand that, you know, we'd have the treasure, you know, make sure that they dispersed and hadn't had them change it. But um, I'm sure each ITC, you have your process for what you're doing with that. Um, but if this is something that you want to use for any remaining districts, if you haven't already, uh, what this option does, if you enable this module, it lets redesign authenticate the accounts, um, the account profile, uh, so that it can say like, okay, yeah, this is a valid user account, and it'll let them reset the password themselves. It still does not bring over their old password, but what it does do is it lets them use, like it basically acts as an expired password, and then when they go to log into the software, they would use that like change password, password reset option instead. Um, if this is something that you wanna look into and use, here is a link in the wiki. And then this is actually what has kind of like the walkthrough and um, the additional details on actually using that. Um, the next one here is the mass change service. So um, this adds the mass change option to um, any applicable grids and um, for the users that have uh, the, ac uh, the appropriate access um, to those. And um, what this does is it gives an ability uh, to update a group of records um, all at one time. And um, there are you know, quite a few different options for how to set those up, for how to execute those. Um, 
we did a training uh, not too long ago. I think it was like a couple months ago at this point uh, that you can find the recording for. And that is on um, that training page that Pat showed earlier. And we also added a full page in the appendix of the wiki for mass change information. So um, I included the link here and you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and open this because um, it does show, you know, turning on the module, but then here are all of the grids that that's gonna add the mass change option to. And then we have um, information on the permissions and then how to actually um, create and utilize those mass changes. So if that is something that um, you wanna learn more about, um, definitely check out that training, definitely check out this uh, documentation page for that. All right, the pre-encumbrance module. So um, what this one does is it adds requisition amounts um, and future requisitions to the account grid. So we were looking um, in the core accounts, we were looking at these account um, amounts earlier. And um, when we look on here, we have requisition amount and then future year requisitions. So by default, uh, these don't, the, the actual like requisition amounts don't necessarily show on the accounts because not everybody may use those um, or want those on there. Um, but if that is something that the district wants to track to be able to have on the account, and then, you know, kind of as we talked about, those fields can also be used on reports, then turning on this module, uh, the pre-encumbrance module will add um, and track figures that are related to amounts, you know, before they're actually encumbered to a PO, they're just at the requisition stage. Um, a note, this does um, impact the remaining balance on an account. So you can see here, uh, cause this kind of shows you how it calculates. So, you know, you have your budget, it's adding encumbered amounts, um, accounting for adjustments, and then it's taking out expended, encumbered for the unencumbered balance. Um, but then at this stage, it's accounting for future encumbered amounts and requisition amounts before it actually calculates the remaining balance. So that is important to know um, if you have a district that's, that has this turned on or is gonna turn on, uh, that is gonna be in the calculation. Okay, so we're kind of rolling right through these, but some of these, um, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, not, I think that's kind of kind of specific to like, you know, if you have a district that wants this, I don't know that these will be something that, you know, that all districts will use. Um, the simple balance checking module, even more specific because um, this is used in combination with the pre-encumbrance module. So not every, you know, district may track their pre-encumbrances. And then if they do, they, either do or don't have, you know, I mean, they may or may not use this um, balance checking module. Um, but so this allows, um, allows those amounts to be used in balance checking for requisitions and for encumbrances. And there are these certain rules that can be turned on in order to do that. So, you know, when they're processing transactions, do they want the requisitioned amounts to be calculated in like whether or not they can post a negative budget or they'll get a warning, um, you know, for what they're allowed to create a new transaction for. And I have this classic screenshot on here because this is basically what this module is set to mimic is um, in classic in the USA con screen, they would have a setup where it would be, okay, are we tracking requisition amounts, pre-encumbrance module? Um, and then do you want me to check the rec amount for requisitions or check the rec amount for encumbrances? So when, when a user is entering a new requisition, do you want me to see how much has already been requisitioned against this account? And then, you know, base like if I'm gonna show a warning on that. Um, and so this first one here, track requisition amounts is the, the pre-encumbrance module. These two are, is this module on and which one or both rules are enabled? Um, next we have the USPS integration. I 
think, I mean, definitely the majority of districts are going to have this enabled. This is what lets USAS communicate with USPS. Um, certainly, if there are districts that you have that may only use USAS and not use USPS through, um, through redesign, then maybe they don't have this turned on. But vast majority, this is probably going to be on. It gets, you know, it gets turned on when they start. Um, and then that's what gives the um, ability, you know, for those pending transactions to come over. Um, switch over here. It gives this drop down here um, where there's some configuration options. Um, there is also a configuration, so we're in system configuration. Uh, there's some configuration here that this um, is added with that module, but then this information gets populated to make the actual connection. Okay. Um, let's see, so the next one is user-based balance checking. And uh, this is another one, kind of like the simple balance checking module that it's got a module, but it's also got rules. So user-based balance checking allows them to add balance checking options for um, like basically at the user level. So um, when this is enabled on the system user records, it's going to add this balance checking section where it'll let you say if they're allowed to have a negative appropriation, negative budget, um, or if it's warning on negative amounts. And that is used when a user is putting in a transaction. So if I'm a user um, and I'm going to enter a purchase order, then um, if the budget is going to go negative because I'm entering that purchase order, do I does you know the treasurer want to be able to allow that? Um, so let's go look at these. So system users. And let's just look at a, let's just look at Baker here. So right here, balance checking. Now, if I want to get a warning, if it's going to cause a negative amount, that would be checked. So um, Baker's going to get a warning and it'll say, hey, you know, if you post this, the account's going to go negative. A warning will not stop them though. Uh, this is going to allow them to get a pop-up, but still be able to proceed past it. Um, if I leave both of these unchecked, then they're not allowed to proceed past it. So um, if I, well, okay, so I probably worded that poorly because the warning itself, this is going to say, yes, it's going to tell them. Um, but these top two, so if all of these are checked, it's going to allow them to proceed past it. I'm sorry. That is when they'll be able to close it out, continue posting. If I did have these unchecked, like what we were looking at the first time, then they're not allowed to proceed past the warning and they will get an error and they will not be able to proceed past it. Um, however, okay, so these fields are added with the module. Um, it puts them there, you're allowed to click them. That's one piece of the puzzle. However, there is additional customization here and this part also has to be done with the module in order for this to work. So we're gonna go to system rules. And what I would type in here is I would go to this name um, part and I would put user based because the, the rule is the user based balance checking. So all of these different rules that are tagged as user based balance checking rules can be used with that module. And you can see we have some that are enabled already. So um a budget balance check when there's um a distribution um pending transactions balance check so those were some of the warnings that i was seeing earlier um but if there are additional things that they want to turn on like if they want future purchase orders um i'm so sorry i keep trying to click this future purchase order if they're entering a future purchase order and they want the warnings the the setup that they have on the user uh, like a warning or an error to also apply for those situations, then they would need to come in here and enable this rule as well. And so that would be clicking enable, uh, saving this up, and then also clicking this activate on the top of the grid to put that in place. 
So um, they could have the module enabled. They could have all the right things checked. But, you know, if the district's saying, hey, you know, this is really weird. They're not getting an error. They're not getting an error or a warning, even though I have those things turned on when they're putting in X, Y, Z type of transaction, like it may, they may just need to come in here um, or you at the ITC may need to come in here and review, you know, which things are turned on for those user-based balance checks to apply to. Okay, okay, cool. We're, we are rolling right through these. Um, so, Let's see, mass change, pre-encumbrance. Um, some of these like notification services and stuff, we're just gonna kind of um kind of pass there. Um let's go to the workflows module. So the workflows module, we just did a training about uh workflows on October 1st, and the recording is out there. Um, but this you would turn on the workflows using that plus, and um, then let's go to Oops, let me just um, refresh this. I'm not sure what I did there. Probably hopping around too much, um, but we can still see what we need to see. So we're gonna proceed. Uh, so that goes ahead and adds this workflows option, um, the menu option here. And then it also adds some fields on my actual requisitions that are related to, um, well, actually, I'm sorry. Um, it adds my workflows, but I do have uh, some configuration to do first. <laughs> so it adds the configuration for my workflows configuration. I can turn on requisition approval. Um, the module is just workflows because there are other things that could eventually be done with workflows. So um, for now, it's requisition approval, but you know there could be like form approval or you know different types of approvals. Uh, we're taking feedback on, you know, what uh, you guys want to see, what the districts want to see um, in the future. But so for now, it's requisition approval. Let's save that. And then um, we'll need to refresh. Okay, let's hope. I'm not really sure what I did to cause this error, but uh, probably um, my clicking around. So I'm just going to hope we don't get, we don't run into to that again. Um, okay, transaction, requisitions. And if we look at one of these now, um, we can see that we have some additional fields. We have the approval status. Um, I can submit for approval. I have an audit trail um, for approval and those sort of things. So that all starts um, again with turning on the module. And get back here. And um, we do have workflow procedures in the appendix of the wiki. Um, and there's a whole walkthrough there of how to turn those on. And, um, you know, once you get the module on, some of the things we just saw with uh, going to the configuration, turning those on, and um, Pat talked through all of that as well um, on that recording from October 1st. Uh, we do have a slide. So here are the uh, modules that do require a restart of the instance. So these are things like Active Directory. Um, if you did do that legacy password migration, um, those you would enable the module, but you'd actually have to do like a full restart of the instance. Um, so, you know, if that's like whether it's your VRA or if you're having your tech department um, oh, okay. actually prompt the restart. Okay. All right. So that takes us through modules. Um, we're going to switch gears to monitor next, but um, any any questions, any discussion on any of those modules or anything we wanna um, see additional there? All right, well, we'll just keep rolling then. So let's see. Um, okay, system monitor. I know Pat mentioned, like, I do like this part. Honestly, monitor, it's really, uh, it's very, very helpful um, when you're trying to look into certain things that are happening with the instance. And um, mostly like this, I would, this is something that is a tool uh, at the ITC level. So 
Um, this isn't something that like um, even like your manager, your USS manager, um, I don't have uh, access to this normally um, at the district. So uh, this is something that's like admin or there is an admin events permission um, that would allow them to use the tab to view these tabs. So if they did want to, um, you know, that's what you would you would grant. But um, I don't know that that you would um, necessarily need to do that. So we are going to system monitor. And once we get in here, okay, so we have a bunch of different tabs here. We're going to go through each one of these, and I'm going to show you, you know, specifically the ones that um, are most useful. But uh, let's start on events is where where we pop up. And what this grid is doing is this is kind of just tracking, you know, different things that are happening in the system. Um, it holds the last 200 events in the application. So if you're trying to look back at something, uh, it, it may not always be in here. This is more like recent events. Um, but I do have this drop down at the top. And I have um, a bunch of different things. So I have like slow metric events, things that took a while, uh, recent events, slow queries, which, you know, so like when it's trying to query information in a grid, um, life cycle, recent exceptions, auditable events, authentication, and metric events. Um, I use probably these, let's see, um, usually this, it's not always slow metric events. I think just um, either slow or recent metric events is something that I use, um, you know, maybe not all the time, but it can be helpful if you're looking at like a report starting um, and generating. So like here is a report, let's see, a cash account report. So this was a cash summary. So um, as of 6.15, so this is the cash summary that Pat ran earlier to show you guys. Um, has a timestamp, so she ran that at 9.18. These are how many milliseconds passed um, that it took for that report to run. It was run by the admin, and, um, and then this one is when it actually generated, so that's when it completed. So if you were to look at like the difference between this time and this time, I can see that that took about uh, what 15 seconds to to actually generate. I don't necessarily use this one a lot when I'm working with like, uh, you know, when I'm helping you guys with tickets, like I don't necessarily look at that with the district, but I have done some like, you know, if we're looking at like, how long does a report take? When was a report run? Like that kind of helps if, um, cause we're gonna see like with the app log, uh, we'll look at like, other timestamps of, you know, maybe when an error occurred. So having a timestamp can sometimes be helpful. Uh, so you can kind of use that page for that. Um, let's see. Recent auditable events. So this one can be helpful um, for uh, certain things like um, installing a module or opening and closing a period, a payroll posting, that sort of thing. So I was in their um, opening periods. So check this out. Here's where I installed the workflows module uh, just a bit ago, 1107. And uh, that was me, username, admin, that's who turned it on. Um, so just kind of some general information there. If something got turned on and you're not sure who did it or when, uh, that can help. This is us enabling a rule. Uh, here is a posting period close event. So again, um, you know, this is something that happened earlier and admin and we went in and we closed month three in fiscal year 2022. Um, so this is just kind of nice. Uh, you know, here was, a, um, well, so I guess this is open, close, and then close completed um, our, our separate events. But uh, this kind of just helps you, I mean, especially if you're trying to find, hey, when was that closed or opened? Um, and I'm going to be honest, I kind of forget about this one sometimes. So even reviewing this to talk about with you guys today, I was like, man, I need to use this more. <laughs> um, authentication events is the other one I want to look at here. So uh, this one is um, definitely more for the ITC technical staff. And um, 
I don't know, we don't usually um, inquire about this one, but it can be used like if there are authentication issues. So this it's like authentication success, um, you know, and gives you some more of like the technical information about the um, like username password authentication. Uh, yeah, not really one that I use, but it is here. So um, if you're looking, you know, if you need to try and look for information related to recent like login um, information, this could be uh, could be helpful for that. Let's switch over to the status tab. So uh, this one I do use, but in very specific situations. And a lot of times this one is something that uh, comes into play. It could come into play uh, definitely when you're migrating a district. So um, it's important to come in here. This is gonna tell you if everything's completed successfully, is running appropriately. Um, see, this is all what we wanna see. Completed, success, completed, completed. That looks great. When you're migrating, there are some situations where um, you could have like maybe the activity ledger if it runs into an error or the encumbrance ledger if it runs into an error on import. There are situations where these can either still show as running or, or I'm not running, um, like started, but not completed, not success, or they could show as failed. So if you get, um, you know, an error, especially in like these messages up here, when you click this, this is one thing that you would check when you migrate districts. If you get an error there, you can come right into monitor and look at the status. And if you see one of these that are failed, then that's going to be, you know, your first clue as to what might be wrong or where to look. Um, and depending on, I mean, we can certainly help you with like the next steps from there. But that definitely is um, something that, you know, we may ask you to look at, um, you know, through support uh, to see if they're, to see if these are okay or if something might be wrong. The metrics tab is the next one. Uh, honestly, this one, definitely more technology, more techie. Uh, this is um, something that is used for monitoring the statistics um, of like performance, memory, etc. I definitely, I don't really use this tab. Um, and I think it's more so, you know, if it's something that our, um, you know, uh, developers or techniques to see to help you diagnose something, we'd probably let you know what to look at. But on the support side, I don't think we're going to be really looking at this um, that much. Logging is another one. Um, so this one is, again, not really something that you would need to use at the ITC. This is something that um, our SSDT developers may use to help debug something. So, um, I mean, there certainly could be a scenario where we may ask you to turn something on in here. Um, but honestly, we're probably grabbing a backup and the developers are probably using this functionality there. So I don't see this as something that you'll be um, needing to come into very often. But uh, basically what it does is it's just, it kind of narrows it down to very specific pieces of the software so that if something is um, you know, going wrong and you know, we'll ask you for the application log, we'll ask you for um, like a certain stack trace from an error that you get. And um, basically with, um, with using these, um they would come in here and they would be able to like turn on a higher error uh, error level <laughs> um so that when it outputs a certain error it's going to include like more information potentially um for that specific thing and then the developers would use that to be able to pinpoint if there's an issue and make any changes so again i i don't think that you're going to be um, really in here and changing anything very regularly, unless SSDT, you know, directly asks you to. So I usually skip over this one too. But this next one um, is the app log. So this, I love it. If you are not in here, this is a great, great tool that really can help. Um, this is also something that if you, if we're looking at an error together um, with a ticket, like we may need you to come in here and there's a, potentially a lot of information that you can find. So 
Um, first of all, this logs the activity within the application. Um, and then let's see, okay, so the server logs that we'll look at where you get the server logs and sometimes we ask you to send those to us. The server logs do get refreshed if an instance is restarted, but this doesn't. So this keeps a longer track of uh, potential like information or errors or warnings. So this can be like a really, really useful tool. Um, and also it's a lot more user friendly than trying to dig through one of those uh, server application logs. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is here's a timestamp of when certain things happen. Uh, this is the level of, you know, what this information is. So if, if uh, somebody got an error in the system, if there was just like an informational, um, something that was stamped on like, hey, this, this thing happened within the system, or if there was a warning, then each one of those things gets stamped here. And then here's like a name and a message. And what you can do, so these are my kind of weird errors that I got after, you know, installing that module. Um, I could click right on this row and what it's going to tell me is, okay, there was an exception, but then it's going to give me some more information. So this exception detail, this is huge. Uh, not every error always has this, but this is what I always hope to see. So you can take this and copy it. And then let's open up uh, Notepad++. Um, grab a new one here. And so this, I mean, you know, this isn't, this is kind of something that's more um, techy, but if I needed to figure out what's happening with this error, I could take this, I would copy it in a notepad and save it as a TXT. And this is what you could attach to the ticket to really help us. So this is what we could have a developer look at and see and say, okay, uh, this will give them the clues of what's actually going on with that error. Um, this, it would be the same thing when I got that pop-up that had the red box around it. And, you know, I kind of just like clicked out of those right away. Um, a lot of times a user will be like, hey, I got this error. They took a screenshot of that little red box um, and then they just like attached it to their ticket to send to you. Um, but then when you need to report it to us, um, obviously this right here is a lot more detailed than what was in that little screenshot. Um, so if they got the error, um, when they, you know, clicked this button, they told you about it. Um, if you find out what time that screenshot was for, like, if you ask them, Hey, about what time did that happen? Then what you can do is you can come into your system monitor app log. You can find that time. And if you see an error from that time and you can get the full error message, that's really going to help us be able to diagnose, you know, what happened and um, hopefully get you a quicker answer than trying to kind of like dig through and we might not be able to tell exactly. So this can be very helpful tools for both of us um, to be able to help um, the districts or see what's going on. You can filter on this level. So I very commonly <laughs> come in here and filter just for the errors and then look through, you know, to see, okay, an error happened at this time. Um, let me see if there's one. I don't know if I have one in here. Um, this can be any error. So like, this is a track of all of them that have happened. Um, so that's kind of why I like getting the timestamp to try and figure it out. Like we can see here, if I click on this one, um, this is like a duplicate key value. And so what this is, is, uh, here's an account code. Um, when I was entering my account codes for, uh, to be able to push over those pending transactions, I entered one that already existed. So I got an error telling me, hey, um, on your account, like this account already exists, it's a duplicate. And that was uh, an error that I, as a user, got um, on 1013 at 1411. <laughs> and um, so this is just a record of that. So, you know, not all of these necessarily are, you know, like, like you kind of have to sort through, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, there are things as well, just outside of errors, you know, we have some of these like um, informational. So here is info, modules, 
And then this was, it was finding an audit event. And what that is, is that there was a module installed. So um, this one, a little bit earlier, when we installed a module, here is another uh, record of that happening. And, and we saw that in the audit events on our first tab. So it's just kind of tracking all activity that happens within the, in the software. And um, I know this can be a lot, uh, to look at. It certainly was like overwhelming when I first found it, but you know, um, and not all of these things always are going to make sense. Like they might need, they might be things that SSD team might need to help with, but this is a great first step in being able to actually, you know, come look up something that happened. And the other reason I want to mention this and, and, you know, kind of point this out so much is because if you can get, you know, if you're helping a district and you can get a time frame for something that happened, um, you know, even if you're not comfortable right away with coming in here with all of this, that would really help us be able to see what's going on because we can, you know, use those timestamps to narrow it down. Um, and certainly once you're comfortable with coming in here and looking um, at certain errors, you know, the piece that's really big is if it does have um, and see these ones don't have, they don't always have that, that um, detail at the bottom. But if you can find an error, if there is one that has this exception detail, you know, that is really, really helpful to us in um, diagnosing um, certain issues. Okay, so that's my rant. That's my rant on the app blog. <laughs> that wasn't wrong. I do love that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Uh, threads, I'm not sure. This is again is another technology, like another tech side one that I really don't come into this. So um, we're gonna move right on to the admin logs. And um, for the admin logs, let me switch. I'm gonna test instance. So I'm gonna switch over to my um, PowerPoint so that we can, uh, let's see. We made it pretty far here. Okay. So the admin log is basically a version of the classic import log, which since I'm in my you know little test instance is why mine's blank. But usually what you will see there is just one line and that one line will have um, a way to open and view this abbreviated version of the classic import log. So this is something that you should be reviewing for sure when you um, uh, migrate the district over to redesign. And if there are warnings or errors in there, we have those listed. Um, here are some links to uh, different pages to assist with any errors. Um, but if we uh, look at, here's an example of what that looks like. You know, it gives you the status of like, if that's completed, it shows you the different files. These are the SWAT extract files that it imported. And then here are some examples of the errors. Um, one reason that I look at this quite a bit, I mean, I don't actually, I'm not always coming here and looking at the import log um, itself, but on the grid, and again, I apologize because I don't, I don't actually have a row here, but when you come in here in a live instance, it'll have the name, it'll have the source, it'll have different information, but in here is a date. And the date is the date that the district migrated over, like when their um, data was actually imported to redesign. So, you know, once you get more districts, once you're down the line, like sometimes if you're looking back at transactions, um, if we're trying to troubleshoot something and maybe something ties back to something that happened when they migrated, I come in here as just like a quick reference of knowing exactly when their data was imported to redesign and when they started in redesign. So just kind of a little trick there. I guess I'm not sure, you know, how often you need that. If that's something we just kind of use more in what we're troubleshooting, but um, I've found that it's very helpful if I can look back and say, okay, they um, came into redesign on March 19th of 2019. And I know any transactions before that were imported, any transactions after were created and redesigned. And that can just be helpful for certain things that we're looking at. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, info, again, not one that I come into very often. I don't have this one in the PowerPoint because uh, this is another little techie, techie page, but uh, the server logs. This is going to be the last one that we talk about. Um, 
so I mentioned, you know, the app log keeps information like the server logs do, but these are um, kind of refreshed when an instance is restarted. Um, but what you have in here is um, you have the different types of logs that uh, the system holds. So uh, there are a couple different times, types you can see in the naming. Um, this one, this last one that we see here, uh, this says current. Jason, this is the one that we're normally looking for. Um, some of them have dates in it. So it's like the app web docker current is going to be today's log. Or um, if you had several days in here, it would be like the same starting um, like naming. And then it would have the date. Um, and I think they say for like a week or something, unless it's restarted. So we may ask you to come in here and send us a log. Like if we're like, hey, something happened yesterday and uh, the development team wants to look at the log, like you may need to come in here and like current would be today. So find the one that was dated with the 14th um, and then grab that if it's available. Um, and there is another way to send these if you are just sending this current one. Uh, you could instead go to the help about and then uh, send this server log to SSDT and that'll actually just send it right to us um, to a certain folder where we can access those. Um, sorry to hop back and forth here, but um, let me go back to monitor real quick because I should have showed this before I left the page. Uh, on this page in the server logs, if you click on this, it's going to download um, a log file that would save to your computer. And then you could like attach that to the ticket for us. Um, whereas the one under the help about will actually just send it. And then again, the cache, this is nothing that, um, not one that I use. So. Um, we're gonna leave that one alone. But um, let's see, let's go back here. Uh, here's the information related to those server log files showing that you can send it. And that is all I have. So we did, we finished up about half an hour early. Um, so uh, we do have time, you know, if there are questions about anything that um, Pat or I covered today, um, certainly happy to, to take some time to answer those. But I know we've been a quiet bunch, so um, I'll hang out for a minute. But if there are no questions, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll get this recording posted on the website um, where, you know, on the training page Pat showed earlier. And um, thank you so much for joining. And I uh, hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks, everybody.